do we mean by democracy? It's a word that's in the news these days. We said we were going to democratize Iraq. During the current unrest in North Africa, people talked about an Arab Spring and a breakout of democracy. We surely don't mean a majority vote. After all, Saddam Hussein had plebiscites in which people kept re-electing him. There are plebiscites in Castos, Cuba, the former Soviet Union. To paraphrase Plato, when thieves steal money from a bank, they divvy it up by a majority vote. Are they Democrats? The answer, of course, is that there's something else involved besides majority vote, something that makes the majority vote in present-day Israel democratic, but not necessarily the majority vote that brought in Hamas to power in Gaza. What, what are those things? And to answer them, I think a good illustration would be the origins of democracy, where it came from and what consists of democracy. The word means power to the people, demos kratia, and it originated, of course, in classical Greece in the mid-fifth century. But it wasn't a new idea in itself. It was a development of an older concept of what we would call constitutional government or consensual government. The Greek word was politeia. We get politics from it. Politics, political government. Somewhere in the 8th century BC, for the first time in the history of Western civilization, and indeed civilization in general, groups of citizen, that was a new word as well, decided to govern their own affairs according to majority votes. If we say that constitutional government is in the center of the political spectrum, there were offshoots to the left and offshoots to the right. Consensual government meant that property-owning men, not slaves, not women, not youths, would get together and in a tripartite fashion vote. They would have an assembly of uh, citizens who were also hoplites or soldiers. They might have a judiciary and they might have an executive, an archon, but there was a checks and balances in this system. This was pretty much characteristic of Greece uh, in the 8th century among its some 1,500 city-states. However, there were aberrations. To the left was democracy and to the right was oligarchy. Power of the people, power of a few people. This entire spectra had replaced tyranny, the illegal assumption of power by one man without birth connections, and monarchy, the assumption of power through kindred ties. Somewhere in the middle then was politeia, constitutional government, and we had the aberrations on the left and right. And we associate these mostly with Sparta and mostly with Athens. In the case of Athens, it was a regular politeia, constitutional government. It was faced with extinction by foreign powers and a democracy one at the Battle of Salamis, again at the Battle of Plataea, and it began to inherit the Aegean from the defeated Persian navy, and it began to assess tribute. That turned into an empire, and from about 480 to about 430, it began to become a radical Plataea or a radical soon democracy. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, they had votes by the majority, but that wasn't enough for the Athenians. They had sortition, or the selection of their officials by lot, as if the senators in California, for example, would be picked by the California lottery. They had other mechanisms to equalize wealth. They confiscated wealth and made the wealthy produce plays or outfit warships, or they would ostracize people. Everybody didn't like Lady Gaga. If 70,000 people vote on any given day to get rid of her, she's got to go. Things like that. This was an aberration because Athens defeated Persia, had a large fleet, was able to hire the poor to serve as rowers in the fleet, tax the wealthy to build walls, and land became less important. The urban population that was outland had employment during war as sailors and as construction workers during peacetime for fortifications and the great monuments of Athens that we associate with Pericles. Another aberration happened that made a adaptation from Politeia on the right. And that was at Sparta. Somewhere in the seventh century, they decided not 
to send out colonies, not to intensify their agriculture to meet growing population demand, but to go over the nearby mountains and to conquer an entire Greek-speaking people, the citizens of Messenia. And they subdued these uh, Greek-speaking Messenians and they called them helots, those taken, serfs. And that required a constant military force, or I should say paramilitary force, that a very small city-state of Sparta that only had about 10,000 full citizens had to subdue 200,000 helots from Messenia. And that sparked a series of events in which Spartan society was militarized. People from seven to the ages of 30 were in the barracks, so to speak. There was a small group of citizens that were equal but not people who were half Spartan or not Spartan at all. And it became a champion of oligarchy. Rather than getting as many people as possible to participate and making sure they were roughly the same amount of wealth, it restricted the franchise to a very small number. And these were, I guess we could call them aberrations from the central idea of constitutional government, of a broad-based citizenry that was representative in nature. Not everybody voted, but enough voted to be a, a near majority. Now, what happened to this system? Well, it collided in 431 in what we call the Peloponnesian War. And after 27 years, Athens was defeated, Sparta was victorious, and it looked like oligarchy was now the wave of the future. Maybe, maybe not, because in the fourth century, Athens came back. But this had a profound effect on the reputation of democracy hereafter. If we could jumpstart through the Roman Republic, through medieval Europe, and I say through, we have Republican government in Europe, we have things like the Magna Carta, the Swiss cantons in the medieval ages, Renaissance thinkers as diverse as Machiavelli, uh, enlightened thinkers like Hume, Locke, Montesquieu, and we get to the Founding Fathers. And what do they take from that 2,000, 2,300 years of both practice and abstraction? They take the idea that never in their right mind would they ever want to institute a democracy. Nobody had done it since, and nobody wanted to be Athenians again. Why? Because they looked at Athenian history, not only had they lost to Sparta, but more importantly, they did some things that were chilling. They executed through a popular court the philosopher Socrates, the giant of Western philosophy. The democratic government got angry, trumped up some charges, whipped up the mob, bam. Unfortunately for Athenian democracy, we have portraits of the assembly in action in the historian Thucydides, and it's usually pretty chilling. Everybody says Pericles should start the Peloponnesian War, and as he says later after the second year, you were all for it, and then when it went bad, now nobody's for it. Sort of like Iraq. 76% of the American people are just enthused about the Iraq War when the statue of Saddam Hussein falls. Three years later, 3,500 people dead, 26% are for the war. And so in the founder's view, this is just too dangerous a thing to ever implement. You do not want 51% of the people on any given day directing policy, and you don't want them uh, trying to have an equality of result through things like liturgies and ostracism. So let's try a different model, and the model that they chose was the middle model, slightly more oligarchical than democratic, and what we call politeia in Greek became Republican government in Rome. And think about it. It had checks and balances. There was going to be not one, but two legislative branches overseen by a, an executive or an administration, all adjudicated by a court system. Uh, the president would be elected, but his bills had to be approved by Congress, who were elected but can be removed, and power then was not confined to the hands of a very few. And look at some of the things they did that we find as radical Democrats today, we find very bizarre. They left the question of who could vote to the states. And so it wasn't until about 1812 through 1830 or 40 that people without property could vote. Because being good founding fathers, they looked at good Greeks and they looked at politeia that wasn't oligarchical and wasn't democratic. And they said, you know, they had something there. They had a property qualification. Now, we find that illiberal and abhorrent today. But the founders said, 
you know, if somebody inherited property, they worked hard and bought it, then they are a responsible, sober, and judicious citizen. And if they didn't, well, they're a renter. They have a renter mentality. That fell by the wayside, of course, in the early 19th century. But some things didn't. One was the electoral college, that the popular vote does not pick the president. The winner of each state then gets electoral votes. And why was that put in? That was another lesson from Greece, that you do not want to go into an urban atmosphere on any given day, allow 51% of the people to express themselves. What that would mean without the electoral college is if you came to California, you would just go to two cities, San Francisco and Los Angeles, and you wouldn't waste your time in Visalia, California. Or better yet, on statewide, you would never go to Montana, Wyoming, and Utah. And yet the founders said, whether it was the papers of Jefferson, even Hamilton, or, or the Federalist Papers, that their great fear was piling people up in urban environments where conformity and consensus and uniformity were too prevalent. Their ideal was the Greek yeoman farmer, the hoplite soldier, the, the owner of 15, 20 acres. And so they really wanted that person to have influence and they were afraid if without the electoral college that these people would be just ignored because in numbers they would be far fewer than the urban population. They did not think that senators should be directly elected. That was the House, the House of Representatives. You could have one man, one vote in the House, but Montana today has two senators, and so does California. So one man has a lot more vote for senator than does in California. And that is a liberal evolution from what the founders envisioned, that the two senators in both states should be selected. Now they're directly elected, but still, as you can see, the founders looked at classical history. They were democratic in ideal, but in practicality, they wanted to have some of these restrictions so that on any given day, 51% of the people did not do what they otherwise would. And of course, the more we become radically democratic, what do people complain about? We have a Republican Party that is more for a restriction of direct democracy. We have a Democratic Party that wants more direct participation. And you can see these age-old issues played out. The Democrats want to get rid of the Electoral College. They think that we should just you know, have a popular vote because most of their constituencies are in large states and large cities. The Republicans feel that they have more people in rural areas and therefore the Electoral College and the Senate should stay as it, it is. Californians are always demanding that Senate should be like the House and we should, eat, we should have four senators and you know, Montana should have nothing perhaps. So there's always this anger that the, at the founders and the Constitution. We saw it with Woodrow Wilson and we see it today. Our system is not fully democratic, but what we don't see is it's not fully democratic for a reason. That the classical examples of democracy in Athens, for all the Parthenon, for all the great victories at Salamis, for all the splendid oratory of Pericles, gives us nightmarish examples of what 51% can do on any given day. And whereas the Spartan model or the Republican model suggests that if people can't directly vote but can do so through representatives or they have to share power with other offices and bodies, it's a superior form of government. That leaves some questions, however. What is the advantages of democracy? Whether we mean just plebiscites or constitutional government or consensual government. Why do we find democracy not only better for us, but we think that Arabs should have it. The Arab Spring should be democratized. Vladimir Putin is culpable because he's not democratic. We're angry at China because their free market is not followed by a constitutional and democratic system. We're trying to tell everybody from Africa to Latin America that we want you to be uh, democratic. What do we mean by that with small d? I think the answer simply is that throughout the ages, democratic governments are A, more legitimate. That is, if a majority of the people have expressed their wishes either through a direct vote or through a vote for their representatives, then the government has legitimacy. When Saddam Hussein went into Kuwait or he attacked Iran, the people didn't vote on it and their representatives were not voted upon who approved it. And so it was an illegitimate war. Today, if Iraq remains a functioning constitutional government and they choose to fight in Kuwait, 
then that is a legitimate decision because it is the product of a majority of the citizenry. Does that have advantages? Yes. It means that if a dictator decides to go into the Falklands and from Argentina and he loses and everybody blames him. If the present democratic government, and there is one in Argentina, decides to do the same thing, then they have no one to blame but themselves if they lose and the government probably won't fall. It's a reflection of 51% of the people, in other words. So democracy, constitutional government, consensuality gives the veneer, at least, of legitimacy. It also involves people from all different classes and walks of life. It's a very volatile, organic, uh, living organism, so to speak. It's what the Greeks, in a pejorative sense, called the oklos, or that the Romans called the turba, the mob. You can see it in your movies of the Colosseum, thumbs up, thumbs down for the winner or loser of a gladiatorial fight. Or you can see it in the famous trials at Athens where people try to plead amid the clapping, jeering, yelling of the crowd. This is a very powerful force. Things catch on and they just ripple throughout society very quickly. If you want to go to war in 1941 to retaliate against the Japanese, and you're completely unprepared, as America was. You decide that women shall work in factories and men shall go to war, and the democratic consensus can be a force multiplier to change. Democracies mobilize people, they mobilize ideas, they create consensus and uniformity. Uh, it reminds me of a thing that, a very strange quote that Herodotus said once that when the delegates from Ionia went to Sparta to convince them to help, during the Ionian War, they couldn't get any of the representatives to say much. When they went to Athens, they convinced 30,000 people to send aid. And what he meant was it's easier to convince a mob sometimes than it is a few sober and judicious citizens. In other words, there's an advantage as well as legitimacy. What's the disadvantages of democracy as we see from its origins and its evolution to the modern age? I think we've touched on it before. A mobocracy can be uh, the ultimate expression of democracy. In other words, people, if they get revved up and if they are not checked by statute or if they're not checked by sober leaders, they will want to do things. I mentioned wanting to go into Iraq and then blaming people for sending them into Iraq. Uh, I don't know how in the world they can give Lyndon Baines Johnson, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan all landslide votes since they represented the poles of the American political experience, but they can. In 2008, everybody wanted to have hope and change Barack Obama, and suddenly that's not such an issue anymore. And so they get galvanized, they're mercurial, they're capricious, and that has worried people uh, all across the ages. There's another thing that bothers uh, people about democracy, and that is, I guess I'd call it the popular culture. Democracy is inclusive, and as Plato said, to be inclusive, given that most of us are not smart, attractive, wealthy, or well-educated, you have to, by definition, lower, not raise standards. And he said that the ultimate logic of democracy would be lowering it till even the donkeys and dogs could participate. And you see in our national public discourse, when we were 21, uh, you could vote, then you had to be 18 and you could vote. Now people are saying, why can't 16 year olds vote? Property holding white men, all white men, blacks, all women, and now there's all other suggestions that even people who are not legal citizens, like illegal aliens from Latin America should vote. The logic, Plato says, is always to expand the political participation of democracy until it almost means nothing and more importantly to take the culture and dumb it down so as many people as possible could participate. It used to be seen that a gentleman in America in 1930 would have a nice suit on and a hat. Today you can see Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, billionaires, and they will have t-shirts and Levi's and sneakers on. A farm worker and a Wall Street grandee can both jog or they can both wear them indistinguishable. Because in a democratic culture, you're trying to ripple culture out to as many people as possible, and that means there's going to be very few requisites. All the things that oligarchy and aristocracy and constitutional government in the conservative sense create, in a modern sense that would be things like opera, philharmonic, uh, the instruction of Latin and Greek in schools, natural aristocratic 
requisites to participate in the gentlemanly life or the educated life are being broken down because they exclude too many people. Nobody needs to know who Mozart is or Beethoven and listen to symphony to just turn on rap music. Anybody can understand it. Uh, in today's American education, standards go down, not because we don't believe in standards, but because if we do have standards, not everybody can graduate from high school. So if we say today, I have a bachelor's degree from a university, that means to our society that you have the same entree as somebody did in 1960. Does it mean that you are, can read and write and think and have mathematical quantitative abilities as well as someone did 30 or 40 years ago? Absolutely not. But we will change the rules, so to speak, to allow as many people to participate as possible. Let me review for a second. All of our current debates, whether it's about the popular culture, or the electoral college, or the age of voting, or motor voter registration, represent nothing new. They're age-old polarities between the few and the many. The few tend to want to have restrictions on constitutional government that do not allow as many to participate and do not allow those who participate to have such instantaneous and influential decision making. And those who are pure Democrats want as many people to participate with as few restrictions as possible. Where does this lead us? Well, I wish I could tell you to stability, but Aristotle and his politics thought that both oligarchy and democracy were aberrations or defective versions of a constitutional government in the middle. And as we look at the history of the United States and the history of court decisions and the history of voting, we see that we're moving well beyond an oligarchy, well beyond a constitutional system to a radical democracy. That is, we're getting to the point where we want as many people to vote with as few restrictions as possible to increase the number of ideas or inputs, and we want the culture to be as informal and as participatory as possible. The age-old criticism of that, going back to the Greeks again, there's a fellow named the old oligarch, we don't know much about him. It's an anonymous treatise from 440 BC, but he's walking through Athens and he says, the problem with Athens is unlike every other city-state, nobody looks any different. A slave doesn't get out of your way. A poor man thinks he's the same as you are. There's no hierarchy. There's no distinction for all the work or the birth or the class that you have. And what he's saying is that in the logic of democracy, we end up with a boring uniformity where everybody is not going to be risen up and to acquire culture, but dumbed down and to be uncouth. The question is, though, is this sustainable? Because once you destroy hierarchy, and there is no hierarchy, or once you expand the franchise so that everybody can participate, at what point does it become unworkable? In other words, if you say that people who do not have American citizenship should be allowed to vote, at what point do you have chaos? Which brings up two central issues in the classical critiques of democracy. And one is that Aristotle said that even though the word meant power of the people, demos kratia, it really wasn't. It was rule of the poor. Inevitably, democracy degenerated into an equality of result, not an equality of opportunity. What did that mean in Athens? That meant that, for example, in the fifth century, everybody who wanted to vote voted, but he only got paid for going to the theater if he was poor. In the fourth century, he got paid for going to the theater and he got paid to vote. And the burden on the very wealthy always increased to redistribute private funds to allow people who did not have such money uh, some semblance of fairness. So there was this notion that redistribution, and I, I guess I could use the word class warfare, even when we call it democracy, ultimately the majority of the citizens want a minority to subsidize them to bring them up to par in a relative sense, not an absolute or abstract sense. You tell a modern American that he has a big screen TV and he's pretty well off, he's gonna immediately say, I'm not as well off as somebody else. And that's the purpose of democracy is to use government and the tax system and the political system 
to redistribute money and to make us all of one class. And that's as old as the very idea of democracy itself. And that poses real challenges in today's world. The second is one that is voiced by uh, a lot of critics of democracy in the ancient, medieval, and modern worlds. And let me just make a, a little detour in saying, in the ancient world, we do not have one extant supporter of democracy. Maybe in a few plays of Euripides. By that I mean Aristophanes' comedies, Plato's dialogues, Aristotle's politics, Thucydides, histories, the old oligarchs' treatises, what do they all have in common? They're shocked, sickened, angered by Athenian democracy. Is it because of aristocratic prejudice that only wealthy people learned how to write so well and had that privilege education? In part. But in part, it's because they felt that democracy had warped an earlier system that created stability and continuity and had warped it by giving people something they had not earned, whether that was political rights or economic uh, advancement. But here's the thing, and this goes on through Roman literature as well, Juvenal, if you read Juvenal's take on bread and circuses, the mob that you give them bread, you give them a circus and they're happy, or Suetonius, or the decadence you see in Petronius, Satyricon, there's no positive view in, in ancient literature of democracy. This has picked up the same negativity uh, most commonly in the Germanic, I call them the Germanic nihilist. If you were to read Hegel, or if you were to read that nut Oswald Spengler, The Decline of the West, or if you read Nietzsche, The Will to Power, Man and Superman. And you can see where this leads to, but they make the critique of democracy that in the modern age, just as in the ancient age, it is very dangerous to empower the average person without suitable education and requisite standards of behavior. This is especially true in the technological globalized world. Somewhere in the 1940s and 1950s, the onset of technology and the ability to export goods and services and ideas allowed a tremendous increase in wealth without a necessarily a uh, commiserate increase in the knowledge or the requirement about how to use that wealth. I'll give you an example. When I was teaching in 1984, I had a student who was a doctor's wife and she came in with a suitcase. Every morning in 1984 was a cell phone. And she told me it cost $2,000 and only she and her husband had this in her neighborhood. And obviously only people of her status and culture and education could have it. When I left, every one of the students had a cell phone. They were ubiquitous, they were cheap, but everybody was calling, using them when I was speaking. And so that there was no sense that this was a privilege. And so we had empowered people with technological independence, but without requisite cultural knowledge how to use it. And this is the complaint, as I said, of the German nihilists. This is why during World War II, in German propaganda, as abhorrent as it was, it was always American cowboys versus culture. Uh, civilization, which is wild and rampant, is not the same, according to Nietzsche and Hegel, as culture, which is the creation of a superior uh, way of doing things. And in the critique against America, it was that we let so many people participate and we have so few requisites uh, about their participation that, and we're so adept at capitalism, that the combination of capitalist goods and democratic freedom creates something that the Romans called luxus, or lycintia, luxury and license. That if you take away the family, the community, the church, all the breaks on the appetites, and you say that the common culture should be able to express themselves as they want, and that the Kardashians is the same thing as symphony, or somebody showing up to a polling booth in cutoffs with no shirt and no driver's license should have just as much right as a guy in a suit with a driver's license, and that's pretty much where we are, then you have no culture, and you have chaos, and you have not improved the citizen. And the role of government is not just to protect the citizen, but to improve him. In other words, we've taken the idea of an equality of result rather than equality of opportunity. Republican government, in the ancient sense, means quality of opportunity 
democratic government in the ancient sense means a quality result. I think when say in our own experiment with democracy, we went from a Republican and Roman ideal of an equality of opportunity and a restriction on some participatory guidelines, cultural, political, to an equality today of result where we're all expected to end up the same and everybody is the same politically, culturally, economically. What will be the future of this? Well, it's not pleasant to look back in history because there was a fifth and fourth century Athens and 1500 city-states, but there wasn't a third century independent city-state. Once the majority decided to get, become more and more radical and to pay themselves more and more people, the people who paid for it ran out, they disappeared. And when people get up in the assembly and says, I don't think I should have to fight, I think he should. Or I don't think I should have to pay for that play, I think that guy should. Or I saw my neighbor's farm, he has a thousand olive trees, I only have 50, why is that? I think I should be able to have some of that. It disappeared. And in the Roman case, when we started out with an Italian agrarian parochial society, where we had all of these cultural breaks on expression, the family, as I said, and, and Roman traditional religion and the small towns, and we turned it into a multicultural, multilinguistic, multiracial empire where everybody by 200, roughly 212, 215 AD was a citizen, whether they spoke Latin or not, whether they were born in Italy or not, it became so chaotic that by the sixth century uh, there was no Roman Empire. And by the fifth, when it started to disappear as a political unit, people said, I don't think I should have to fight. I think they should have a, a larger bread dough. I think they should have better circuses, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the same is true today if we look at the European Union. It started out as a collection of trading partners that wanted to bring down tariffs or even abolish them. And then it expanded to sort of a political union. And then it expanded to incorporate Mediterranean Europe that had very different culture, very different history, very different attitudes than did Northern Europe. And then it incorporated Eastern Europe, and then it started to have a common currency, and then had a common culture. And finally, people in Athens, what had started out as I'm very lucky to have access to German technology, ended up as I don't think I should have to work like a German. They've got it wrong, but I want German technology. And so we ended up in chaos. So where does this lead us in America? We have a great challenge, and that is how do we extend this democratic experiment, allow it to be inclusive as it is today, allow our culture to be rich as it is today, but preserve enough hierarchy uh, that we aspire to ascend commonly hand in hand, rather to descend as democratic cultures have devolved in the past into unpredictable, and dangerous mob-like political entities and bastardized uh, cultures as we see uh, in, some, in some of the darkest aspects of American culture. And that, that challenge is really what most of American politics is about today. Between people who want to get more people, more people, more people uh, equal by result, and people want to have uh, more and more standards, more and more requisites, and fewer people equal. I don't, they don't say they want fewer people, but that's the result that'll happen if their policies were enacted. So we, we want sober and judicious citizens that set an example for everybody. Everybody participates, but they understand they'll never be quite all equal. Or we want everybody to participate with a goal, indeed, the, the commandment that at the end of the day we'll all be the same. That's pretty much democratic politics over 2,500 years.